it's always good to have you join us for your favorite program. This is our premium chat show on Close Flow. And uh, every week we we'll try to bring onto the screen to bring to your homes or your offices or wherever you are all over the world yet another distinguished Nigerian who is going to be sharing with us some experiences, some perceptions, some, well, as I, as I always say, deep reflections on how the story of Nigeria can actually be retold. We know that um, everywhere in the world, people see Nigeria as the giant of Africa. But today, we are looking at a critical element of how that uh, posture or that status or that impression can actually be uh, defined, properly defined. So are we actually the giant of Africa? Is it in terms of learning? Is it in terms of our capacity to read and study? Is it in terms of our capacity to actually understand the environment where we are in? Is it in terms of our capacity to contribute meaningfully, positively to how Nigeria can become one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth? Now, these are some of the questions we are going to be borrowing the brains of our distinguished guest here today. Incidentally, our guest, I must let you know, just to give you a tip of the iceberg, is trying to say to us that our living conditions, our human development, are the mechanism for us to become a real nation. We only start if we can read. Now, if you don't know how to read, if you cannot read and write, if you cannot even, um, well, <clears throat> have a conversation, an intelligent conversation with your neighbor, then maybe the story of Nigeria is just uh, not getting the right uh, kickstarters. So we are now looking at how our guest, who actually, as the author of The Colors of Life, a devotional that she wrote to let us understand how life can become best and even more meaningful, more impactful, if we apply ourselves as the Lord God has made us. She wrote that book as a reflection because for all her years in training people on what to do, on how to read, especially children, she saw the need for us to go back to the brass tacks. She's a bachelor's um, degree holder in French from the University of Benin, a master's degree holder in international relations and strategic studies from Lancaster University. And also, she holds a postgraduate diploma in theology. So we are saying that our guest actually is overwhelmingly capable of speaking up. Yes, these days we are speaking up. Yes, we want to speak up as a nation particularly as we are transiting to yet another uh, political dispensation. So, you got to meet our guests. Just wait for us shortly. We'll give you a tip of the iceberg, and then I get to present to you our queenly distinguished guest. Stay with us. Experience unlimited super fast internet access from Intel 4G. <laughs> Intel, live more. Hey, beautiful, your eyes, your smile are all begging me to take you home tonight. Now, reading page three. Experience unlimited super fast internet access from Intel 4G. Intel. Live more.
So there it is. You have our Excellency, a member of the Order of the Niger, right here with us in the studio. Coco, you're welcome to Plus Flow. Thank you for that. <laughs> what do I say? Come after Livu or Sava uh, Bien or what? Nam Nam Pokskel Sava. She's she's trying to send me back to the class, so I need to go and relearn all that again. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Now, Coco, how how do we how do we start it really? Um, how do I begin this with you? Because uh, we are talking about uh, reawakening reading culture in Nigeria as a way to change the pace of our development. Is that really practical? Is that doable? Is that realizable? Is that something that we should? Something that we should what? <laughs> we should continue with or just ignore? Um, if we ignore it, we ignore it to our peril. Um, Nelson Mandela, yes. our father, said education is one of the most powerful weapons with which we can change the world. And any developed society is built on a sound educational foundation. We can't go far without that. We'll be shooting ourselves in the foot. So for us to catch up, <laughs> we need to begin with education. Hmm. And, and we go back even to reading because reading is a communication, helps us with communication. Yes. And the world is all about communication. So we receive information, we give out information. This is the information age. We are trading mm. in a knowledge mm. economy now. So we are as strong as our knowledge base, hmm. as a people. So it is important, it is doable, and it's something we cannot afford not to pursue. Beautiful. I like that. Now, let's, let's face our audience at home. So uh, because uh, part of our education, like you just said, is also parenting. But many, right now, the population of children not going to school in Nigeria is about one of the highest. 20 million out so, of school children. That's about 10% of, of our the, yes. population. So I, I, as a mother, yes. how does that, I'm not worried about your training now. I'm saying, as a yes. mother, how does that get of to course, you? Of course, of course. It, my heart bleeds. Um, ju just like you said, as, as a mother, and I don't consider myself just the mother of my two children. Yes. children. Yes. yes, but even driving here hmm. in the car, and I see the children on the talking. Hmm. I see the beggars, young children that should be in school. It's a time bomb <laughs> just ticking till, you know, it can't tick anymore it's and it explodes. So we can't afford not to do something about this. In fact, it's a national emergency, the education situation. If 10% of our children are out of school, then we are in trouble. Because if they're not trained in school, then who is training them? What are they imbibing? Then we are leaving them to vices. We are leaving them to... Street life. Street life. And we know the danger of that. So as a mother, my heart bleeds. When I, when I see them on the road, my heart just breaks every day. And that's the truth. Especially the boy child, because I have a heart for the boy child. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, yes. talking about the boy child, that brings us back to the question of leadership. Now, so where did we get it wrong? Is, is it that our leaders were not properly trained or that we did not uh, imbibe the right culture in our disposition to manage? What, what exactly, where did we get it wrong? Hmm. <laughs> now, leadership can be, you know, from the girl child or the boy child. Yes. It's when we come to the family, then the, the father is the leader of the home, the head, and the mother is the helper. But all of us can be leaders in society in different spheres. I like that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> where have we got it wrong? Um, I'm someone who does not believe in pointing fingers at whether yes. it's government or, or anyone, because I believe the government is a reflection of, of the wider society. Mm. So I don't believe our problems begin and end or rest on the shoulders of government. I think it's on the citizenry, which is why, you know, people like us, so my disposition is in my little corner. What can I do? Yes. So instead of pointing fingers and, I, you know, I live in an estate, and sometimes you'll see people driving on the 
wrong side of the road in an estate where there is no traffic and you don't need to do that. Why would you do that? And then we point fingers at our government. I'm not saying our government is doing well. No, that's another discussion. But what I'm trying to say is, can we all look inwards and say, what have I done wrong? And above that, what can I do in my own little corner to make a difference? You know, and, and, and that, is, that is my heart. That's how I see things. That's how I started um, this work. Okay, you this know. foundation. Exactly, the Rainbow, yes. the Rainbow Foundation. Really just started from, from passion, not from, oh, you know, let's do any big, just me looking, because I've always loved to read. I've come from a family of educated uh, people, three generations, four generations. You know, my grandfather went to the great Hopodil training institution in Calabar. You know, my father went to St. Patrick's Calabar and became a lawyer, went to the UK, became a lawyer. My mom is from a family of educated people as well. She's Jamaican. <laughs> And she went to the UK to study, met my father, and they came back. So education has always been important. We've always had books and a family library. That's how come, you know, mm. I got into reading. Mm. So I looked at my life and said, you know, I thank God, you know, I'm comfortable. But what about others? You know, and when we were living, one of the first things I did is we're living in an estate of comfortable people. But we drive out of the estate and see this is in the Niger Delta. And just see the sort of thing I see here, but another picture. People just lazing around, not doing anything. So I said, you know what? I need I to get to these something. people reading. I must do something. And, and that's how we started. So I want to encourage everyone in your little corner. Don't give up. But that's a way to also fight the vices in the society. Brilliant. I hope our viewers are watching so they can join us in this conversation. Because that niche making that you have just described here is very critical. Now... Um, you have just said something that already is part of what we want to ask you. Nigerians are excelling as learners, whether academically, professionally, or even vocationally, in foreign lands. So what is happening here? Is it, is it some kind of environmental condition that is making us to be poor learners within our environment? Is that, is that? Well, we, we could assume that from the evidence. You just as you say, we are excelling everywhere. So yeah. I think you've given the, the right um, society, the right opportunity that we would excel. We are hardworking people. You know, we are go-getters. You know, we are, we are enterprising people, Nigerians. And it's evident, as you say, wherever we find ourselves in the world. But the living conditions are harsh, to yeah. put it mildly. Yes, yes. they are harsh. And, and it's getting more difficult. The depreciation of the Naira, the fuel scarcity. I was telling you on my way here, I got caught in a petrol line because I took a certain route, you know. So, and once the cost of fuel goes up, the everything. cost of food, everything, how do we want people to survive? I believe the maximum, the minimum wage was like, th or is like 30,000. Yes. You can't do much with 30,000 today. So life is difficult. It's like economic slavery. It is very, very, and I don't know how long this. people can survive under these circumstances, you know. And unfortunately, it's pushing our brightest or anyone that has the opportunity out. ICT, sometimes you're trying to do a transfer on your bank <laughs> app. It's not working. And my husband is in IT. He said to me, the bank, the IT professionals have gone. So even the banks are suffering. The big multinationals, my, my, my nephew works with them all. He was working with a multinational, one what of now? the oil companies. He told them he's going to Canada. They offered to triple his, his salary. I'm telling you. So everyone is touching everyone. You reach the poor. Medical, you don't even want to think about yes. that. Because you yes. say, even if you have all the money in the bank, if you have an accident, an emergency situation, you're going to go to the hospital that you thought, I won't go because I can just get on a private jet and go to Harley Street. We've heard of very wealthy people who have lost their lives yeah. because of poor medical facilities. Yeah. Okay, all right. That again is um, a little bit of um, pessimism, but uh, we'll look at how we can change all that. Now, literate citizenship. Elsewhere in the world, is like um, the primary purpose of being together. Uh, countries like, uh, small countries, where we don't even regard them as, as developed. They have high literacy of over 99%. Yes, like Cuba. So what, now, Coco, so how do we, so how do we change that narrative about Nigeria? So are we the giant of illiterate or giant of, uh, of literate minds? Where, where are we? Hmm. 
priority, you know, I believe. Priority, sincerity of purpose, you know, integrity. Now, when we say we are prioritizing education yes. and increase the budget allocation to for education, it bothers me because I'm like, hmm, does this increase really translate to a better quality of education? Or are these funds going to be siphoned, hmm. <laughs> you know, or not appropriated in the best interest of the citizenry? So sincerity of purpose is so important. Um, integrity. We won't go anywhere without integrity, hmm. you know. Look at how, how do we get books into our educational system? Is it just because I know someone in the ministry and I'm guaranteed an income? Because if your book is accepted, then millions of children are forced to. What is the quality of, of that, that book? book? Yes. Are we accepting books on merit? Or is it just because who do you know? And, you know, so we keep shooting ourselves in the foot. Integrity, sincerity of purpose. We need to return to that. What, what will we do for the good of the community, not just for ourselves? Mm -hmm. I can't say I'm isolated because I'm privileged and my children can, you know, you can send mm, your children abroad anywhere, and all yes. that. What about all the other children? You know, I think it, Ubuntu, is that what they call it? The, the ideology, it's a, it's, I think it's a word from one of the African countries, yes. the ideology of moving with the crowd, moving together. We need to have more of that mindset. If not, we are not going anywhere. Okay, now, how do we unlearn? Uh, let, let's look at another typical example of what you are talking about now. Yes, Mbutu, that's Swahili, but uh, are we going to be together? That's an, 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 a different question. Now, how do we unlearn this culture of impunity and entitlement that we, we see in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the upper class, where everybody is like, well, it's my turn, it's, my, it's, it's, our, it's our inheritance to be this. How do we unlearn that kind of mindset and culture? Yeah, it's very sad, you know, but I think that um, carrying everyone are, along, Ubuntu. Yes, may help us. Developing everyone, yes, because I think it's out of fear. It's fear of, I don't want to be poor again. I want to be able to provide my own security. Because there's no social net for me. So you see everyone provides their um, electricity, water. Yeah. water. Now you want to provide your, your own medical road. facility. <laughs> your own road, everything. I think it's that. And it's a very short term. It's a very uh, myopic yes. view of life. Yes. 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 Because you may think you're fine, but <laughs> unless everyone else is fine, you are not fine. No. If something happens to you, mm. God forbid, <laughs> you have an accident, you hit a, an okada, or so all the okadas will come and lynch you or something. I've I've heard stories that are real stories. Why you've not lifted them up? They are angry. They are mm. frustrated. Mm. To them, if you're in a decent car, you represent the elite that is oppressing them. So none of us, nobody's safe. The sooner we realize that, the better. Except you want to run away from here. And if you want to run away, well, you know, I don't even know that you're safe where you are because of the law of harvest. Whatever you sow, you will reap. reap. Yeah. So I think we should think not just of ourselves, but of the wider society, of others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Help the other people. Okay. Now, I don't want to bring the God factor into it, but uh, there's no way we, uh, we are not going to look at our faith also may have affected some of this uh, uh, processes. But now, librarian, for instance, you gave me a good example at home. You have libraries at home. I don't know how many homes have libraries now. <laughs> hmm. And a library is a collection of books. Yes. A library is a collection of books. So we, it begins with those in charge of the homes and usually to be the adults the parents understanding and appreciating the importance of reading and therefore that's how they accumulate the books it's not like let me go out and buy books so they'll say i have a library no it's that you're reading as a father so if you mother. don't have that disposition you may not actually you may not even think of it that you can you can have a library exactly which is why i think parents or the adults have a very important part to play in encouraging reading. We have an example of a lady, it's from the United States, um, Ben Carson, the, the, the doctor, the, the great you know, 
pediatrician, yes, yes. Ben Carson. His mother was illiterate. I love that example because you don't even have to be educated yourself. But if you understand the power of reading, then you can change the future of your children. So she was a single mom. She wasn't educated. She had two sons. And they were at the bottom of the class. They were being mocked in school. But somehow she, she, she understood the power of the book and reading. So she enrolled them in the local library and she would borrow a book a week for them. Mm. Was it one or two? Let's even say it was one. And they'll have to read the books. And share. And share and tell her what they read. Mm. And soon those children topped the class. And today we see who Ben Carson is one of the most celebrated medical doctors in the world. He yes. even ran for presidency, yes. or he, he, he came out and put out himself for presidency of the United States of America. He's written several books. He's a celebrity now just because of reading. Hmm. And recently at, at the book festival a few days ago, I also met um, a young man. He's publishing something called Kuda Kids. Um, books for African children. Now, he, he went to school here, himself and his wife, but he tells me he did, um, I think, an MBA in Cambridge or so. And he said he just, you know, going out there, going to the best schools, and just discovered that, look, this place is not home. Home hmm. is Africa. So we better educate our children, you know, that wherever they are to know what's going on on the continent. Because it's a... The, I'm, I'm getting to other waters, you see, once you get me started, what sort of books as well are our children reading? Because we find out that the children of the elite in Nigeria, the parents are proud to say their children are going to schools where the Nigerian curriculum is not taught. Yes. That's what we are boasting about, hmm. you know. And that is, that is a colo colonial mentality, hmm. co you know, slavery of the mind. Yes. You are proud that your children know about Amsterdam, Edinburgh, you, the United well, States. About, uh, they don't Ajegule. know anything. A lot of the Ajegule, a lot of the children don't even know the different states in Nigeria. They don't know the different ethnic groups. That's a real problem. Holiday, we don't take them around Africa. We take them outside. So they don't, and then the ones that are now also going out hmm. are even more removed, far removed. Now, one of the ways, the good thing is that they go out there and they, they discover it's not home. It's never the same. Then you need to know about hmm. home. And that's why people like Kunda Kids, I yes. think that's what they, they're publishing. And even at Rainbow, we are beginning to produce books that tell the stories of notable Africans, hmm. illustrated biographies of notable Africans. Pictorial. Pictorial, yes, to, to fill this gap, to educate our children, not just the ones here that don't know about the continent, but also the ones in the diaspora. Brilliant. I must commend you for that. Now, I love that uh, uh, attempt to change the tra uh, tragic trajectory, you know, of our growth. Uh, my, my only worry, how impactful has this been for you? Um, have, you been a, have you been discouraged by, by the turnout, by the impact, by even the encouragement? Are you getting support from other government? Or, uh, how discouraging has it been? <laughs> you mean the work of trying to promote reading in yes, Nigeria. Yes, yes. Um, well, I'm focused. Um, I don't think anything will discourage me. Yes, I'm focused. And it's, it's in my heart. It's a burden I, I, I carry. And I've realized it's I have cross. to live with. Yes, if you call it that, I have to live with it. But you have to discharge that burden by doing several things. So, But along the line, we have worked with several governments, mainly the government of River State. The administration of um, Governor Amechi was very um, supportive, supportive of our work, and that was that was wonderful. The governor used to go into a classroom on the 27th of May. Yeah, we used to take the governor into a classroom to read to children on the 27th wow. of May. Yes, but we also did that with Governor Fashola, um, you know, ministers Dora Kuyili, Desani Alisa Madweke, Vice President Oshibanjo has done that. And we did that on purpose to bring them to the children. But I'm, I'm excited when the men are reading because in the course of our work, we discovered that the girls were more inclined to reading than the boys. Ooh. And even in the homes where parents read to children, we found out from our research that it's mainly mothers who read. Who read. So we wanted the boy child to see reading as a macho thing. And that's why I went for the men. 
I could have gone for the governor's wives and I said, no, no, we want the governors. We want to take them into the classroom and sit and interact with the children. And then um, Governor Mechi also um, asked us to organize a book festival in yeah. Port Harcourt, yeah. which we did. Yeah. Yeah. So that support was excellent. And then when we decided to bid for Port Harcourt to be world book capital, yes. we took the idea to him. We had to take it to the presidency as well. And at that time, President Jonathan was running um, Bring Back the Book campaign. Yes. So he came behind it. Governor Mechi came behind it. We bid it. And we got it against all odds, you know, wow. beating um, um, cities that beat it, like Oxford, you know, cities in, in Moscow and, and all that. We got it. So government support is very important because that supports at the institutional level, you know. So it would be great if the government, all of them in the different states, gave reading a place of priority, going to classroom, read to children, but not just that, develop libraries. We ran... 200 book clubs in Port Harcourt we set up in the World Book Capital year yes. because the World Book Capital tenor lasts for a year from April April 23rd, which is World Book and Copyright Day, one year to the next. And in that year, you're supposed to um, organize programs that promote books and reading. So we set up libraries, we had book clubs, we did all sorts of things in that year. So it's 200, very important. 200. We'll, we'll come to take the numbers again. My producer says to me that uh, if I don't uh, take a break because she needs a breather, she already spent some time here. So we need time to also get our guests to come and, well, our viewers to come and ask our questions so that uh, we also can be on the same page. So we'll be back shortly. Just stay with us. When we come back, I'll give you the dedicated lines where you can call us wherever you are from, from wherever you are, wherever you are in the world. She's, she's actually eager. Maybe you're in Cuba or Jamaica. You should be able to call <laughs> and then speak to her. Just stay with us. We'll be back shortly. We must dilate the eyes. We look for the body. They have cataracts. We look at the back of their eyes. They have glaucoma. You know, to do a full workup for them. You will remember the government the should actually try, open their eyes. Them. You will, you south, will south, remember with no state there. We're going to be looking deeper than we ever looked in before to ensure that um, we, we close all the loopholes. Every edition is an arresting conversation with distinguished Nigerians from various strata of the society bearing their minds on how we can realize the Nigeria of our dreams. Join us live on Close Flow, Monday, every week here on NTA2 Lagos Network Center. Close Flow, the conversation is about you. Thank you for staying with us. We see have Coco in the house and um, she's quite um, raring to go to answer all your queries and your questions. So let me quickly give you the numbers for you to reach us and then um, ask her what she can do for you. You can call if you want to hear a sweet voice, a very <laughs> malicious voice, please call us on 080-5975-3044. To call and to hear her, please call us on 080-5975-3044. But if you are calling and the calls are dropping, which is rather peculiar sometimes, you know, around here, then send us SMS, so we just read out what uh, your queries or your questions are. Uh, send us SMS on 080-6350-8434. 080-6350-8434. If you have data, then send us WhatsApp. It's faster and it's easier. WhatsApp us on 080-2038-4130. 080-2038-4130. She's here and she's ready to go. Incidentally, the first question... This uh, outreach, why are we mentioning only rivers, Lagos? Why not other states? Why not Kwara? Why not Sakoto? Why not Kanu? Why not Kaduna? What, what happened to those states? Thank you. So, um, naturally, it's where we, we are a non-profit. So, it's where we have partners. Support. Yes. So, we've, we've, we've done work in Abuja. We've done it in Cross River State. Um, Yes, and then we've also done, in the World Book Capital Year, for instance, we worked with all the federal government colleges, or should I say the federal government colleges in every state and the FTC. Oh, they came. 
They did not come, but one of our programs was something we called the Walking Book, where we, as I said, one federal government in each of the states, right? So we trained the teachers on how to work with the children to get stories from their communities. And they submitted stories from their, so let us say Lagos State, they'll say we want to write about the area festival, yes. we want to write about this, then we'll narrow down to what they're to write about. Then the children will work together to produce a story. We called them sights and sounds of their communities. And we collated them in a book. Wow. Yes. So that way, we also engaged children from around, you know. And then we do have people reaching us. They reached us from FGGC, Yobe, I believe, last month, to say we want to set up book clubs. And we send them a template. Yes. Schools in Ibadan have reached us in Akwaibom. We send them a template because the more, the merrier. We want them to run book clubs in all the schools. So it's it's not just been Lagos and Port Harcourt. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for that because some people are a little bit worried yes. that maybe you are paying attention to the rich cities and not to everywhere in Nigeria. Yeah, the, all they have to do is to reach us. We'll be happy to, you know, assist okay. them. Now, now we are also looking at remote learning. We are also looking at ICT and how people can learn e-learning and all that. How, how are we doing that with, uh, with, the, with the foundation? Is the foundation also getting involved with that? Well, the foundation is taking things one step at a time. For instance, as I explained to you, we have these books, which is our latest project of notable Africans, which we are writing. And it won't just be about people. It will be about events, like what is First Act 77, you know? What, what is the Abba Women's Riots? What was it about? So those books are going to cover such Remarkable. stories. Remarkable. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to have e-versions of those books as well, so that... That's part of plugging into modern learning because we can't run away from ICT. That's the way the world is going. <laughs> so, yes, the foundation would be embracing any modern tool that will help our work. Okay, all right. Let's come back to the question of uh, how all of this can change. Some people are saying that we might need to tinker with our curriculum uh, uh, generally. For instance, the federal government has not allowed that uh, local languages... Modern, to modern tongues should be used in primary schools across Nigeria. How do you react to that? Is that, is that, is, is that, is that a, a, the path that we should... We should, we should, we should? Hmm. <laughs> I read that in, in the papers yes. last week. And I asked myself, should that be a priority? I asked myself, oh, I, I, I love our culture and our roots, our history. You know, we, we are... We are no one if we don't know where we are coming yes. from. But that to be the focus. What I read said they would be teaching <laughs> in the local language. I wondered, should that be our priority? You know, I wondered in a global economy, how would we compete with that? I wondered how much research had gone in before <laughs> the federal government arrived that at that decision. And I wondered what we plan to gain by that decision. You know, UNESCO um, released um, a document, a 2030 agenda for education. And we're looking at things like, you know, inclusive education, access to quality education for everyone. I wondered about the 20 million out of school children. children. So those are the things that went through my mind. And I thought, is that... Should that be our priority? Okay, all right. We'll see how we can reprioritize exactly uh, what uh, the educational um, attainment should be. Now, with all the awards that you have received, one question again that seems to be uh, troubling a lot of Nigerians would be the question of, uh, so, the human status of being illiterate, not being able to read or write, that is already threatening the, the, the political environment in Nigeria. Now, should we make it a political agenda for those who are coming to occupy offices? Shouldn't we, can citizens actually get up and say, okay, education must be, we, we, we can't do that? Well, there are different ways of learning. So, so reading is one, and reading is great. But because I believe we are in an emergency situation, situation now in Nigeria, we can explore other ways of learning. learning. Yes, yeah, such as even videos. I see. That's why the radio is so powerful. So 
you know, if we have a lot of people out of school, but you can listen, you can learn by listening. So the radio is powerful, the television is powerful. Since we have smartphones in our hands, hmm. you know, how can we also use those tools to teach visually and all that? While we, because, you know, with reading, you have to learn the skills, the alphabet or the phonics <laughs> to read. So I think we should use every Everything. available tool to move forward. Okay, now, one thing again that we have just said, which is great, is the fact that it's okay, we should use everything to learn. Now, the, uh, the prevailing question now will be this. All the things that we have learned, or that we are learning, okay, intrinsically, how do they define us as a people? Um, is it just what we learn, or how about what we experience? Or just a combination of everything, what we learn, what we experience, what we see, what we hear? Uh, so how do we define the Nigerian that we see today? Well, you know, you have formal learning, which takes place in the four rooms of, uh, four, four worlds of a yes, classroom, classroom, or yes. used to be traditionally, but we have formal learning. But we also have non-formal learning and informal learning. They are so powerful. You know, take for instance, in the commerce world, yes. our Igbo brothers, you know, they have apprentices. Yes. And they will tell you that they learned... What they cannot learn in Harvard Business School, <laughs> <laughs> they learn it as an apprentice of a, a boss in yes. Alaba Market. Yes. They are smart business wise, yes. you know. So that's informal learning. In the marketplace, you know, the, the, the women in the marketplace, informal learning. When we go to the cinema, hmm. informal learning. Music. You see our children, what are, who are the role models they're looking up to? The musicians and all that. They are learning from them. You know, they're learning what they think life should be like. Yes. You know, how they should behave, how they should dance. Informal learning is powerful. You know, someone said, I don't care who writes the laws of the land, but show me who writes the music. Hmm. So the popular pop culture is a powerful tool. So for us at the Rainbow Book Club, for instance... To push reading, we also got some, like, celebrities yes, in to pop join. culture yes. to come and read. So, you know that Bernard Boy is a Port Harcourt yes, boy. Yes. In 2014, <laughs> at the World Book Capital opening ceremony, we got him to read to children mm. for us. Yes. And we, we had other Nollywood, you know, people living above Fibere Stima, who's yes, also a Port yes, Harcourt yes. girl, to read to children. So, we've had captains of industries, different people. That's part of informal education. Then our book clubs that we set up yeah. are non-formal education. Then they're, they're, They can pass for informal, but they are non-formal in the sense that they're not part of the um, school curriculum, curriculum. Yeah. but you read them, you have workbooks that you fill. So that's where we can use our measuring and evaluation tools to see that the children are learning. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think we should embrace all forms of education and be conscious that they shape people and therefore shape society so we should use them positively thank you very much again uh, let me quickly remind our viewers it's like my numbers are not uh, getting true to you i'm still expecting all the calls i said that uh, we are expecting our diasporans to join us they have not called us so maybe we having challenges with that the numbers again call to hear our sweet voice 080-5975-3044 080-5975-3044 or send us SMS. Maybe you should do more of the SMS. Um, 080-6350-8434. 080-6350-8434. Or you can WhatsApp us on 080-2038-4130. 080-2038-4130. Let's get your own opinion on what she has said so far, how we need to embrace all that we, we have to learn and then define Nigeria or redefine Nigeria. Now, what do you think that uh, differences in Nigeria, anytime we have different, differing opinions, it is prone to violence. We, 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 we seem to let it escalate and the next thing is become so confrontational. Why, is that part of what we have learned? <laughs> Perhaps, you know. But also, you know, when you develop the mind, you get to understand that we are we live in a diverse world we are diverse yes. we have male female. female we have different races you know we have different gifts so there mm. would all it's life is plural you know full of variety 
So I think it's a perception thing. If we understand that mm. we are all different, we should be tolerant with one another. Because we are all different, that's what you're saying. We are different. And people will have different opinions. That someone disagrees with you should not be something that should lead to violence. There should be understanding. And that's one of the reasons the United Nations was set up. You know, it says peace. Since peace or wars are constructed in the minds, minds of, of men, me, yes. therefore it is in the minds of people that we must construct peace. <laughs> you know, so we should be we should be tolerant. And and it it hangs on the golden rule to love your neighbor as yourself. So if you love someone, you won't get up and be violent simply because they are different from you or they disagree with you. You know, so we need to <laughs> learn that. Okay, um, in your experience as an author, a motivator, and also the father, you're an entrepreneur. Um, Nigerians get so easily discouraged, particularly because of the environment. So how, what do you say to people, young people who are growing up? who today are facing challenges, and, and they're like, I mean, now we are reporting incidences of suicide in Nigeria. I mean, so how, how do we, how do we? Hmm. <laughs> I would say to them, don't give up. I know it's tough, and it may sound like uh, you're just saying it, but challenges come to every human being. The rich, the poor. That's why you see suicide is not the preserve. In oh, fact, it's yes, usually yes. people who are very highly yes, placed. Yes. yes. So we need you to understand that difficulties in life, everybody faces difficulties in life, you know. Before you take an extreme decision, reach out to someone. You know, I almost want to say, even you can reach, reach out me, to me. <laughs> on my social media, send a message. I will pray if I can't do nothing else, you know. So I want to encourage, don't give up. Look for someone. There must be one person in the you world can to, yes. you can talk to. What's the second, please? Yeah. Uh, um, this is, um, uh, I can't get a name, but it says, please tell me more about the About Women ra Rally or Riot, riot. if possible. If I can get the copy, thank you. Somebody wants to get a copy of the... But well, you have not published yet. Have you? No, no, no. We're just so, saying the sort of interesting incidents in our history yes. that we would want to talk about. Yes. So I would encourage the person to Google <laughs> things <laughs> on Google. When we are ready to write our book, we would then do the in-depth study, not just what is on Google, but books that have been written, you know, people that may have a grandmother that was mm. part of it, mm. you know, mm. it was spearheaded, yes, mm. by, by a woman. So that's just one of the many wonderful stories. There was a similar situation in um, Ake Abiyokuta yes. with Fela's yes. mom, yes. Yes. you know. So some women have done incredible things, you know. Just like you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, now, Coco, uh, something else that I, I also want to find out from you is this. Would you from your experience, would you think that the high rate of illiteracy can be the reason for the underdevelopment of most of Africa? You think there is a direct correlation between the fact that we have such a high case of illiteracy and the way we are seen as underdeveloped? Do you see any correlation? I think so, absolutely. You know, because literacy opens up your mind, you know. Education empowers you. It enables you think. It enables you access information mm. and analyze it mm. and mm. use it. You can use it negatively or positively. That's another That's different, level. yes. Yeah, but at least have that power so you're not left behind. Definitely to your question. Okay, all right. We are still waiting for your calls to come in. Um, I was saying to Coco earlier on that compared to Armenia and Mongolia, so these are small, small, small countries, even Cuba that you mentioned, we are looking at uh, over 99% of them who have gone to school. Now for us, I want us to see how we can get onto the street with this your campaign, for instance, how we can actually nationalize it. That, okay, so the rainbow uh, program, yes, how can we get everybody to get a buy into it? Well, you know, I also always say that this work of getting a reading society is not the work of one person or one organization. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, yes, we shouldn't <laughs> look at it that way. Yes, so different people have different roles to play. Government has a part to play because that's at the institution level. For instance, 
Um, I, be, I believe it's Government College Umwa here yes. that had a um, a policy in the must have been like the 40s or 50s when people like Gabriel Okara were mm. there. I believe Chinu Achebe. It turned out a lot of prominent writers, Elechi Amadi. Hmm. I believe, is it Government College? I can't Umwa remember here? myself. Yes, but one of those, they had a policy that there was compulsory reading time every week and you had to get books from the library and read so people who did not study literature or english became prolific writers you know so that's where government comes in for instance in our weekly timetable they can make it compulsory that we have 30 minutes library time so government is there the corporates are there hmm. corporates have a lot of money you know and they they, 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 they sponsor all sorts of things that's why i'm talking about selfish interests not looking at the good of the society how about things that will really build the the country where you are making so much money so we need corporates to prioritize their social education. responsibility yes. yes and reading it's not something that is not important it's very important because they too suffer i heard a an md of a big oil company once say that nigerian most of the Nigerian graduates are unemployable. Why are they unemployable? Because we are not plugging our resources into the things that matter. At the Rainbow Book Club, when we run the book clubs, our mantra is reading is fun. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want to let people know it's not just um, cramming, because many times it's rote learning, you know, to, to pass exams. Exams. It's more than that. And if you understand that when you read, the world is open to you. You can work across borders. You can be so creative. You, 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 you are wanted in so many spheres. So the corporates have a place to be. The parents or the adults mm. in the society mm. need to encourage the children. You know, rather than putting expensive phones in their hands. Rather than you send them. I, I went to the hairdressers to get my hair done. The parents leave their children and it's mainly the mothers. In the hairdressers, they give them a phone. How about give them a book? And read. you know, my hairdresser said something to me that I consider one of the greatest compliments. I said, excuse me, ma, why are you always reading when you come here? <laughs> and I'm like, you've just paid me the greatest compliment in my life, you know? So it means I am telling people to do as I do. You know, it's something that I do. It's my life. My husband knows it, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm always reading. I read for leisure. I read to relax. I read for information. So we need to encourage the children. When it's Christmas time like yes, now, yes. rather than go to buy them iPhone and all these things, buy them, them books. books. And buy the other children in the indigent communities. Go and give them books. When you give them food to feed their money, give them what would feed their the minds brains. as well. So what am I saying? Everyone has a part to play for us to have a reading society. Okay, Mbutu again, Mbutu right there, uh, being practicalized. Now, let, 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 let's uh, uh, actually doff our out to you for what you have just said, because that's really very meaningful. Now, one thing again that I get a little bit worried about will be the question of how can we sustain this passion? This is where, again, uh, like you said, where everybody should be involved. But individually, how do you speak to our audience our viewers, how can we sustain this passion? Because we can start it now, and then um, a year down the line, maybe because the story is not changing, Nigerians give up. Well, we just must keep at it. We must keep at it. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So we can't give up. It's not an overnight. Uh, uh, no, uh, it's not. This sort of work is not. So we must keep at it. And then another thing, you know, now, Rainbow, we are really, we've always focused on, on, on young people, but even more intentionally now. Because we discover when you catch them, them young. young, yes, then, like for me, it's too late. I'm already hooked on reading. <laughs> so so we, nobody can change that. They can't change it, so it's too late. So I want to, you know, see that passion in all the Nigerian children as well. That way, we, we grow a reading society. And then for those that are older, it's not too late. Hello, yes, hello, hello, hello. yes. Thank you for joining us. Who's calling? Good morning. Yeah, morning. I wondered if the Kokoka language interview is live. Uh, if it is, I would like to contribute. Oh, go ahead. It's live. She's here with us. You can ask her your question. Hello? Go ahead. Ask her the question. Okay. Hello? Please go ahead. Okay. Hey, good morning. Good morning. 
Yes, yes. Um, I, I think that the issue of freedom should also be, be discussed in the ambience of cost of books these days. I read, and I read, I'm a voracious reader. I can afford any book I want to buy. I want to read. But with others <laughs> who cannot afford books, books are very expensive these days. What is the way out? Is there the possibility of setting up a, a fund, a kind of intervention fund for book publishing? Okay, well, okay, all right, let, 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 let's respond to... Make, made accessible let's to the respond. generality of, of people. Okay. I, I know Coco Calango has also partnered with Lagos State in the past. In fact, I think the very first edition of Lagos Street, the brought in Professor Wally Shonika, and I was involved, but I have always read. Let but her please respond to your query. Expensive. Please let her respond to your query. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, we have another caller. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Um, and, and I like the point you've made about an intervention fund yes. to reduce the cost of publishing. That's so important. And I know the Nigerian Publishing Association, I hope they're listening because, again, at an institutional level, we can push for that. But may I also say that we also get creative. At Rainbow, what do we do? One of the things we do is a book donation drive hmm. for this reason. Some people want books, but they can't afford it. And a lot of people... Have books. We have books at home. Books in my parents' home. And my parents have died, but the books are there. They are, they are classics, they are timeless. So what we do is to ask people to bring us those books, and we send them to communities where they are needed. Like now, we're starting something called Legacy Libraries. Yes. And I'm beginning with my grandmother's house in Oban, in wow. Cross River State. Yes, Oban is a village bordering near the Cameroons. Wow. So my grandma's house is there, and it's not in use. And we are working to turn it into, into a, a community library. library. And we've got books that we are sending there. Some of them are used. The good thing is not like clothes. Used books are still books. Yes. So I would encourage everyone to try and do that. Like my the caller yeah, now, instance, who is a reader, I'm sure has a lot of books. Read, yes. yeah, and like my children are adults now. So they know that I take their old books. I leave <laughs> some old that are, you know, that they are emotionally attached to. But I also take their books and my books and we send to indigenous communities. Great. Okay, so that is the takeaway for all of us here. She says to us that if we are going to continue to learn, then be a part of the teaching mode. So share the books that you have. Thank you so much, Coco, for coming on the show. Thank you. We hope to have you again maybe um, in the new year so we can look at uh, the focus for, for, the, for the new year. That's fine. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank for you. our viewers, my producer says, yeah, okay, we are running short of time because another program is coming up. But it's never over on closed flow. You know that. So just go to all our social media handles and go and then do a follow-up and link up with Coco either on uh, Facebook or YouTube so that at least your questions or queries can also be answered. Thank you for watching. And it's bye from here. Thank you so much, Bola. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. We don't have champagne, but it's really good.